But I want to read to you a little bit on this day because this is the birth of the church. Jesus did not have confidence, I don't believe, in these 12 or this 120 in this upper room. He had confidence in what he called the gift of his father, that there was going to be a significant life-altering thing happen on those guys. And it wasn't in the temple that it happened. It was in an upper room, and it wasn't through lots of the means that you would think. It was through waiting. It was through stopping And he said, if you will stop, then nothing will be able to stop you. This is going to start in Jerusalem, but it's going to continue to go and expand and expand and expand. So I want to read to you a little bit, and then I want to share a a few other things with you to end today. But uh, this is Pentecost Sunday, and it's, it's extremely significant that we understand what this is about and the command that God has given us that we would wait and that we would be empowered. So listen this. This is out of Acts chapter 1. It says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Tarry. Kathitso in the Greek. To be seated until you are endued with power, authority, an entire kingdom placed upon you. And you get to reign and rule in that kingdom. So he says, you've got to be seated. This isn't something you can earn. This isn't something you can catch. This is something you have to be to wait and trust. And so he says, for the gift of my father promised. This has been promised. He says, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, listen to this, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If you will stop, nothing will be able to stop you. No geographical distance, no demon of hell will be able to stop you if you will stop now and trust in my promise that I'm going to do a work in you. So after he said this, Listen to this. He was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So in my notes here, I just have written the very last thing Jesus says should probably be our first priority. Don't you think? The very last thing that is that is documented that Jesus said to his disciples is for you to wait. Wait until you are endued with power. If you will wait, every demon of hell will tremble with what I'm getting ready to do in you and then through you. So it says they all join together, listen to this, constantly, constantly in prayer, in communion with God. So they got together and they had a prayer service. And I'm convinced that it was a seven-day prayer service, okay? Jesus was three days in the grave. He was 40 days with his disciples and then he ascended and he told them, go wait in Jerusalem. So what does that give you? 43 days, 50 days later is Pentecost. Seven days, this number of completion. God loves, man, he loves the symbolism. And I love it too. And I, oh. And so when you realize the same exact type of thing happened when they traveled out into the wilderness and they got to a place called Sinai and God told them to wait And they have to wait there for three days. And then God calls Moses up and it's six days. And on the seventh day, God meets with him on top of the mountain. And once again, there's 50 days from when they leave Egypt. And there they celebrate on the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, whatever you want to call it. It is Pentecost. It's where they gave the law, where Moses received the law. But it's also where his disciples received the fulfillment of that law, the empowerment of love himself came within them and consumed, literally, my dad said, I believe I know what the the baptism of fire is. And that is, I believe that God comes and he burns out with his pure love, everything that's not of love. And so what is the fulfillment of all the law? Love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So God, first on the Mount Sinai, he gives them the law. And in the upper room, on the same exact day, what does he do? He fulfills the law by purifying their hearts and putting that agape love within them and purifying every ulterior motive. 
That's what God does. So it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one accord. Unity cannot be over, I don't think, ex- expressed how the, the importance of unity. They were all together in one accord. They were unified and they were in communion with God. It says suddenly, it was subtly, 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 and then suddenly this happened. A sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and come to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them with a capital S. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so you see here that on the top of Mount Sinai, there was fire. You see at Pentecost, there was fire, but it was tongues of fire over each one of their heads. And every single one of them had it. And you see that the mountain in Mount Sinai, the whole place was shaken. In the upper room, you know what you find? Actually, in in chapter 4 of Acts, it says, after they had prayed, the whole place was shaken. And they went out and spoke the word of God boldly, boldly. So it says, this is Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. This is this fearless man now. He was fearful before of a little girl. But now listen, he says, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. They will prophesy. So Acts 2 verses 36 to 41 says, therefore, let all, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, Savior and Lord. He doesn't want to just be the one who rescues you from your sin. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your boss. Okay. Acts 2 verse 36 to 41. 37 says this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So there would be the baptism of repentance and the baptism into Jesus Christ. They understand Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that fulfilled all 330 some prophecies, came and laid his life down, picked it up by his own power. He's standing before you, or he was right here. He's ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand interceding for you. He's the one. And you need to be baptized into a baptism of repentance. And you need to place all of your faith into Jesus Christ. And listen, listen to what he says. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. Do you know what day this was? This is the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. So we had the Feast of first fruits. We had Passover where Jesus laid his life down. We have the first fruits. That's where Jesus is the first fruit. He's the first among the dead to rise from the dead, right? Eternally. Now there had been other guys that raised from the dead. He'd raised Lazarus, but he was raised eternally. Un- unfortunately, Lazarus had to die again. Okay, but Jesus was the first one out of the grave that would never, ever, ever die again. He's the first fruit. You want to know when he rose? When did he rise? He rose on first fruits. 50 days later, right, from Passover is the Feast of Weeks and it's ending the harvest time. And what do we get? We get this massive harvest of 3,000 souls coming to Jesus. It's at, the symbolism is just staggering. So Acts 4.24 says, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They literally cried out to him. 
audibly. They raised their voices. And it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. One of the things that God does through this work of the Holy Spirit is to give you boldness. If we raise our hands and said, how many of you guys are timid to witness? How many of you are timid to... It says God does not give that spirit. He does not give the spirit of timidity, but what? Of love, of power, and of a sound mind. What do we have people today? We have people living in such confusion where good is evil and evil is good. Most young people today think the church is judgmental and all this kind of stuff because if we state any truth about any perversion that's being stuffed down kids' throat today, then we're not loving, according to them, because love accepts everything. So I can allow the rattlesnake into my children's bedroom and let whatever. But God loves and he hates. You know why he hates? He hates because he loves. If I didn't love my kids, I wouldn't hate rattlesnakes on my property. But because I love my children, I hate them. And I've, we've killed quite a few of them out there because <laughs> I don't want them there with my children because I love them. And God hates all evil, all twisting that will destroy his creation. So listen to this. All the believers were one in heart. Here we go again. Unity and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. This is so beautiful. This wasn't the government saying, hey, listen, we're going to take from those who have been faithful and we're going to give to those who, are, according to the Bible, shouldn't even be eating because they won't work or whatever. That's not what we have here. What we have here is people out of such a grace and such a work in the whole, of the Holy Spirit within them that they've become so one that there's no one needy. If anyone needs anything, people are saying, my pocketbook is your pocketbook. I have more than I need and you have a need. So boom, we come together. It's, it's so beautiful. It says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy person among them for from time to time those who owned lands and houses sold them brought the money and the sales and put it at the apostles feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people then the high priest and all the associates who were members of the party of the sadducees were filled with jealousy here comes the persecution they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. I have to wonder how many people in America have heard the full message of the gospel. Because Paul says, I don't come preaching it with words only, but I come with what? Power and authority with signs and wonders through the Holy Spirit. He says, the gospel I'm preaching is seeing that when I show up, the demons tremble and I command them to leave and people that have been oppressed are freed. And so I'm preaching to you that Christ has won the victory and has given his authority back to those who are under authority because that's how you actually get authority. You have to be under authority in order to be, to, to be in an authority, right? Remember the centurion, he says, listen, you don't even have to come to my house I'm a man in authority. I'm a man under authority. If he hadn't placed himself under authority, he wouldn't be in authority. So when we will say, God, I'm coming under your authority. Ultimately, God says, great. Well, then I'm giving you my authority. And now you can speak over your home. You can start speaking to problems. You can even speak directly to demons and they must listen and obey. So here, Paul was saying, I'm going to show you that Christ is raised from the dead. I'm going to tell you about it, but I'm also going to show you that Christ has power and authority and it's working through me and my life. And he's going to demonstrate not with his life and with the power and authority that he has, what his words are backing up. So chapter nine says this. If you look at the story of Saul, who was Saul, who now has been blown off the back of his horse, 
and uh, for three days he is blind. He doesn't eat anything. He doesn't drink anything. And God comes to a man named Ananias and says, go to him, listen to why, because he is praying. Do you see this weave all the way, all the way through the book of Acts? You see the people that were remaining and they were communicating with God. It says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you, right? I'm no English scholar by any stretch of the imagination. But if you look in the original language, somebody, you know what you see? I think it's present uh, imperfect tense. It means not, I did knock. Oh, I gave my life to Jesus 15 years ago. I asked him to come into my heart. I'm good. No, it means presently I am knocking on the door and it's imperfect. It's not done. I'm not done knocking. There's more knocking to do. I'm knocking and saying, God, listen, daily I'm sitting at your feet. I want to sit at your feet. Not that I'm doing it in a wrong way, but I know that there's more to do, right? And I know there's more wisdom. You have infinite wisdom. So what I'm doing is I'm knocking and saying, God, thank you for rescuing me. Can I have my brother? Can I have my cousin? Can I have my uncle? Can I have my neighbor? And so I'm knocking for more. I'm asking and I'm continuing to ask. I'm seeking and I'm continuing to seek. I don't just do this once. I understand this is a process that I need to continue in my life. So he says, knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened unto you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find, right? Ask and keep on asking. And that's what these people are doing. They're for seven days. We already asked God to give us the gift of the Father. Keep asking, keep praying, keep seeking, keep knocking. And God fulfills that. So, It says, then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me here so that you may see again and, listen to this, be filled with the Holy Spirit. This guy, has his life has already been revolutionized. He's already been humbled. And now he says, I want to heal you. I want to fill you and I want to empower you. So he sends Ananias to him to place his hands on him so that he can be healed, filled, sealed, and empowered. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who seals us, right? It says immediately something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So Peter in Acts 10 goes to Cornelius' house. Listen to this. He says, may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answers, three days ago, I was in my house praying. I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Do you realize that Satan will fight you tooth and nail? Matter of fact, I talked about Paul and Silas for just a few moments today. You know what it says? It says at three in the afternoon, at the time of prayer, apparently that was the time that they had separated out to pray, They're going to a place of prayer and that's when they're afflicted and they're taken and thrown in prison. And Satan thinks he's going to keep them from praying in prison. But what happens, you guys know what happens. They continue praying and they're singing praises. And just like I shared with some of the guys over there, you know what happened? It's when a whale, they found that a whale, they call it singing, underwater, the whale's song can travel up to 10,000 miles. 10,000 miles underwater. And when I read that fact, I was like, God was like, that's nothing. That's nothing. 10,000 miles. It's a whale. I can make the song of two prisoners in a dungeon travel for thousands of years. The influence of that one little song right there, or however many songs, in the dungeon at midnight when you think nobody's listening and you're singing songs 2,000 years later, we're talking about it at Palm City New Hope, right? Because Paul and Silas would not be silenced in the prison. And when were they thrown there? They were thrown there as they were headed to prayer. You start saying, I'm going to consistently seek and I'm going to knock and I'm going to ask and I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to keep coming back saying, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I want this work of complete total purification in my life right here. They say all kinds of, you know, all, there's all kinds of different terms for it. 
purity of heart. I love the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, you guys hear me all the time. They're constantly making this illustration, but that's what the scriptures lay out. And I refuse to give up this term that the Bible calls it a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you guys, but I see as I read through Acts, they were saved. Great. Praise God. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. Just like here, Ananias comes to Saul and says, hey, brother. He says, listen, I know you're a believer in Christ. You've repented from your sins, but I'm going to lay my hands on you so you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't even be a Christian without the Holy Spirit, but Ananias knew that God had another work for him, for Saul. And Saul, whose name now is Paul, he goes out and tears the world up. Why? Because he was forgiven? Not only. Yeah, he saw everything different. And he now had his faith in Christ, but he needed the power and the authority that every demon would tremble. You remember when the seven sons of Sceva go and they try to throw out the demons? It says they left naked and battered. Bloodied and battered. Something to that effect. They say, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, right? If Paul would have shown up, we would have been screaming and running. But who are you? <laughs> who are you? Paul didn't, wasn't known by the demonic realm just because he had been forgiven. Paul was known by the demonic realm because he was doing what Psalms 91 ends with, and that is you're going to be stomping on scorpions and serpents, right? You're not only going to be protected from them, but you're going to be crushing them under your feet with this new power and authority that I give you through this new work that I have for you, okay? The, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Cornelius answered three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gift to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has promised you to tell us. Peter responds, you know what has happened, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Do you hear this? Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with what? The Holy Spirit and power. Jesus, his father anointed him with what? The Holy Spirit and power. And he says, Jesus is now the one who's been anointed. That's what Messiah means, the anointed one. What was he anointed with? The Holy Spirit and power. That's what he was anointed with. The same thing God's wanting to anoint all of us with. But Satan will fight tooth and nail and put you to sleep in church for 30 years if he thinks he can just get you to come and say, I've been forgiven and now I believe in Jesus and everything's fine. What Satan doesn't want you to get is baptized by the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and have power and authority over every demonic realm. That's what Satan does not want, okay? He lost one if you've been forgiven and washed. He's lost one. He may lose millions if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and power. Now you're in the offensive And the mercy of God is so awesome. Matter of fact, it says his mercies are new. Listen to this. I, I want to sit down and, and tell you this because I've just recently studied this out and it's so beautiful, but I don't have time to go into the whole thing. But it's not that his mercies are just the same old mercy. He makes it new through the night somehow and gives you, I've refreshed my mercy. Like, you know, sometimes we're like, okay, time out. Guys, you got to go to bed. I got to get a break, right? <laughs> get a break. And I'll have a little bit new mercy in the morning. That's not what I'm talking about. Being refreshed. Old mercy that is refreshed. It says his mercies are new. It means brand spanking new. They're completely different than they've ever been. There's never the mercy that he's given you tomorrow. He's never given you that up to this point. They are brand new mercies in kind tomorrow than they were yesterday or the day before, or the day before, or the day before, or the day before, ever. He says, I've got brand spanking new mercies for you every single morning you wake up. I'm not still frustrated with dealing with you last night. In other words, he's how I've given you new mercies. Praise God for his mercies, okay? 
But what I get very frustrated about is if we live a life and we're just depending on the mercy alone and I'm living this pathetic existence where I'm literally just being constantly drugged down by my own sinful condition because I've never come out of a Romans 6 into a Romans 8 experience. So I I just lean constantly on the mercy of God, knowing that I'm constantly falling back into known sin and I don't have the power to do anything with it. God says, no, I have the grace available and I have my spirit available and I want to baptize you. I want to anoint you with the Holy Spirit and power and authority so every demon of hell hell trembles and you don't have to keep falling back here. Are we going to still need the mercy of God? Absolutely. But you move over into the grace of God, that power to please him in the present, that's something, a whole nother realm. And that's what Satan wants to steal from us. So, he says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. These believers hadn't even been baptized in water yet. They were just, they were believers, but they hadn't even walked in water baptism. And so he says, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you haven't been baptized, Jesus says it is proper to fulfill all righteousness. Every new birth, you have blood, and you have water. When the spear ran in Jesus' side, what happened? He was birthing the church. And what came out of his side? Blood. If you run a spear in my side, blood and water is not going to come out of me. Blood's going to come out of me. Right? But blood and water came out of Jesus because Jesus was birthing his bride. He was birthing his bride. And so there's a scientific reason why that happened, if you ever want to look into it. But at any rate, Every single time in the history of man, when there's a birth, there's blood and water, and there should be rejoicing. And there is in the spiritual realm. He says, boom, my blood washes you, my spirit, right? He says, so symbolize that by what? Going under. When you've died to yourself, new birth, boom, a burial, go into the water, all right? And who's rejoicing? It says the angels in heaven are rejoicing. So there's three things, blood, water, and great rejoicing. Okay. All right. So Acts 11, listen to what it says. Peter defends himself. He says, I begin to speak. The Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Let's go to Acts 15 and then 19. God who knows the hearts, heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he listened to what he did. This is the work that he did. He purified their hearts by faith. Do you have faith that God can not only forgive you, but that his promise is true, that he will purify our hearts? How do we do it? By faith. Say, God, I want you to purify my heart. I'm tired of living a powerless life. I want your power. And power comes through purity. And that comes through faith as we believe his promise that he's going to do this work in us. Right? That was the favorite way that John constantly looked to Jesus more than any other way he described Jesus. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world, right? That's the portion he's shedding his blood. But not only is he shedding his blood so he can forgive you and going and offering that in heaven, but he's also going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to be the baptizer of the Holy Spirit in fire. And that's how John constantly was was, uh, identifying Jesus, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit in fire. Read through it. Read in John and see if I'm telling you the truth, okay? All right, Acts 19. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Who did he find? These are disciples. And asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Think about this. 
This is a guy responsible for over half the New Testament. He finds some believers, and the very first question on his mind, what denomination are you part of? No, that wasn't it. I'm sorry, what is it? That wasn't it. He says, listen, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I understand that you're believers. You believe in Jesus. Praise God. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Listen to their response. He says, they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism. This is chapter 19, Acts 19, verses 1 through 6, 1b through 6. He says, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what you have is these people that have repented, and now they've been baptized in water unto Jesus Christ. They are full-blown believers in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They are saved. They have the Holy Spirit. This, then it says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Acts 19. Acts 19.11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illness were cured and the evil spirits left them. You talk about crazy power. You can read of great people in days of past that just walked in, literally just walked into um, factories or on trains and people started falling out of their seats or while they were working, they just fell to the ground under conviction of their sin, and they started repenting and weeping and crying out. It wasn't from a sermon. It was from God's presence on a man's life. It was his presence that he had been baptized, and all the selfishness and everything else was so pressed out, so there was only one thing in this man's life. And it's not just one person, multiple stories like this throughout history of people who have been purified to the point where God works through just his presence in their life. It's like them glowing with the glory of God. So it says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let me ask you a question. Are you free to share the gospel, to be a witness, to walk in power, or what's hindering you? Because Paul was free to do it with great power, great authority, and no hindrance. Now, it doesn't mean that he didn't have evil forces against him, but there were no interior things that were hindering Paul. Fear was not part of the equation, was it? Lust was not part of the equation. Greed was not part of the equation. He wasn't working, wasn't preaching for the next paycheck. He was staying up at night, building tents and refusing to take anything because he said, I'm going to be an example. He had no ulterior motives. He had been cleansed and purified by this empowering work when Ananias laid his hands on him. Then he got from Ananias what Jesus had got from his father, he was literally baptized or anointed by the Holy Spirit. He got it from Ananias. It flew through, fled, fled through Ananias to Paul. Paul goes and starts laying his hands on people, and guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes upon them with great power. So, First John five six to eight says this: This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Do you guys see that? So I hear all the time, we're saved by the blood of Jesus. You're right. <laughs> but 
But he says, there are, now listen to me, because I'm like on the hairline of heresy right here. I'm on a razor edge of truth. But hear me right, okay? You're saved by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But he has the water of his word that the spirit illuminates and reminds you of the things that Jesus said. The living word laid his life down, but he is living. And the word of God becomes alive when the Holy Spirit is washing you through the water of the word. He comes. And one person said, the Bible is the only book that you, the author has to be present in order to understand it. It's, he certainly has to be present to obey it. He has to be the empowering one, the agent that empowers you. He impurifies you. So that literally becomes part of you, that you become the Bible. You become the walking, talking, breathing word of God. That's what God wants, and that only happens through the Spirit of God living inside of us. Man, I'm putting you guys to sleep, but I'm preaching truth. This is exactly what God is wanting, right? That we would be Jesus incarnate. That's what he calls us, his body. That's only through his Spirit. So we're saved, right? As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have this communion. Jesus forgave us so that we could have communion. God says, listen, I'm giving you this communion, this fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but I want him to do a third work in your heart, if we can call it that, not just so you're baptized into Jesus and your whole life is about serving him, but now you don't have any power. You have the desire, but not the power. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the desire. I'm going to change your heart. As you delight in me, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to wash you, start this relationship, and I'm going to come and I'm going to give you the sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to give you the power and this purifying work so you can actually do now what you want to do. And it says, it's God who works in you both to will. Thank you, Lord, for changing my heart. But in Romans 6, he says, man, I want to, but the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do do. That's, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who could save me from this body of death? I, I have new life in me, but I don't have power to walk in it. And God says, I got this great idea. I've already baptized you in repentance, so now I've been able to forgive you and apply the blood of Jesus that's washed and cleansed you. Now I'm going to baptize you into Jesus Christ, but I got another work. I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And man, you're going to come out on fire and with power and authority, and every demon of hell is going to tremble. And now you don't just want to do the right things, but live this miserable existence where you can sense there's more, but you can't get to it. He says, I'm not going to leave you like that. That would be the cruelest thing I could ever do to you nearly. You want to do this, but you don't have any power or authority to do it. So if you'll start knocking and you'll start believing and you'll cling to these great and precious promises, cling to them. It doesn't mean that you just grab them like, bink, I got it, dunk. You're, yes, you're holding you're holding to these things, right? Through thick and thin, no matter what, you're holding, you're clinging to these great and precious promises. And he says, through those, you can inherit this new nature. But I'm going to test you in it. I'm going to see if you really want it. And if you really want it, you're going to have to die to some things for new life to come up in you. Okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to end here very soon, Lord willing. But this spirit life is pneuma, pneumatic. It's wind. So when you have a pneumatic driver, right, to take, when you go get your car worked on, they take the wheels off you. Boom, they take those nuts right off. Just That's all driven by wind. You can, right, you can do all that, or you can just and take your wheel off because now you're wind driven pneuma man spirit or breath man that god breathed in you so we go back into the garden right and we were innocent but when god breathes in you it's mouth to mouth resuscitation it's new life it says that god breathed into man what this breath of life this spirit in the garden like God put his mouth on our mouth on this clay creature that he created and he breathed his spirit into us. But then God says, listen, I'm not only going to give you back dominion, but I'm going to give you authority and purity. And now you understand that there's an enemy and I'm going to allow you to crush his head. They were gullible in, in the garden. But now 
It's God who's teaching their hands to war and empowering them over here with this whole nother work. So it's pretty wild because I heard a guy speaking this week and he was talking, um, it was Levi Lesko and it was just on the radio, but he was talking about when he went to the doctor and he had this infection. And I can't remember the whole story because I was just kind of listening half, you know, with my attention divided. But he, at the end, he was wrapping this up, just sharing about his doctor experience and how he got an infection. But it was something in him in the beginning that kept him from taking full breaths. And then he got this terrible infection. And the nurse or doctor was talking to him and saying, listen, when you don't take full breaths and expand your lungs through exercise or whatever, or you're not able to take those full breaths, you are prone to infection. You're prone. There's this dormant part of your body, right? That's supposed to be being used. And you're taking these little doggy shallow breaths. And that right there, I just got a picture of we're supposed to be pneuma people. We're supposed to be people that God breathes fully into. Not just like, God, that's, no, I just want a little tiny breath. God says, no, I want to breathe in you. You're prone to infection. If you just get forgiven and your life doesn't become for me to live as Christ, you're going to go right back to all those same addictions. I've seen it thousands of times. All is forgiven. And now I want to do it. Okay, well, here's the pure, here's the cure. Doctors are terrified that many times we go and we get antibiotics and we're like, we take, we're supposed to take them for 10 days or however long they prescribe them. And we start taking them for three days, just like he says. And then we're like, oh, I'm feeling a little bit better. So I just kind of stopped taking them. And so what happens, we don't take the full cycle. And because we don't take the full cycle, then they're very worried because they say, well, you can basically inoculate yourself to that drug. Now, when you take that drug, it won't work because you didn't take the full cycle. And so people go three or four or five times and they take a couple here, a couple there, whatever, and they don't take the whole cycle. As soon as they start feeling better, they think, oh, I'm good. And then when they actually would maybe have a life-threatening illness where they need this antibiotic, it doesn't work because they haven't taken the full remedy. You with me? I'm like, I believe with all my heart, there is a day coming that we're going to need the full remedy. And I'm going to prove it to you with one last thing. Okay? I want to just read you this little story that Jesus gives us. He says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven, this is Matthew 25, will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. These were virgins. They weren't prostitutes. They were virgins. They were pure as far as the world. Again, like, oh, you're goody goody, huh? They were probably going to church every week and they were keeping themselves from bad behavior at this point. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. What does it say? That your word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm going to take some liberty, and I think that God is saying, listen, these virgins, they have my scriptures. They have my scriptures. They have my promises. They know. Re- they can read the word. They, can s- they have light, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He says, they took the oil in jars along with their lamps. So now, some of them, I believe, God is pointing to the oil. Oil is representative of what? The spirit. He says, these people have the scriptures, These people have the scriptures and they have the spirit. You with me? Now, he says the bridegroom was a long time in coming, like to the tune of 2,000 years. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some oil from your lamps. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. 
The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. That's exactly what happened in the ark. Seven days they go in. God brings all the animals, and then God shut the door. For 120 years, they didn't want in the ark. Now all of a sudden they want in the ark, but Noah wasn't the one who shut the door. God was the one who shut the door. Even after 120 years, he gave them seven more days of mercy. If you want to come, I'm calling everybody that wants to come. Anybody that will listen to my word and to the ark of safety. They go in the ark, but God shut the door after seven days. And then nobody could open it. So it says here, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, if I'm interpreting this story correctly, you tell me what in the world does that mean? They're, these are the brides, they're virgins, they've kept themselves from prostituting themselves to other lovers. While they're waiting, they have lamps, they have the promise of him coming, but they don't have oil. And he says, I don't know you. I don't know you. He told him at one point, he said, it's good for you that I go away. Because if I go away, and here's what's going to happen, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit He'll not just be with you, but he will be in you. That's marriage talk. That's intimacy talk. He's going to come in you and he's going to birth a life through you. He's going to know you. Adam knew Eve and they bore fruit. And God looks at these virgins and says, I never knew you. I didn't, I don't, I don't know you. But the ones who had oil, they were invited in. I believe this, that there is a day coming that we need the oil of God. You see, intimacy is better than virginity if you have the right covenant relationship in place. It's not just purity that I'm not participating in some bad things and I have the Bible and I'm waiting for Jesus to come back and rescue me, but that you have intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Is anybody hearing me? And God has this work. There's this man who goes into this art gallery and he's walking by, and I hope Grant will throw the picture up there, but it's called Checkmate. And there's this, nope. So we've got... This picture here on the wall, and they go and they say, "Hey, this 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 picture is called Checkmate, and it's illustrating, you know, this angel walking watching over as Satan is playing chess with this man, and uh, the reason it's called Checkmate is because the man has lost." <laughs> and oh, that's a nice picture, and they all walk down to the next art painting and the next one and the next one they go around the corner but one man in the back he stood there and he stood looking at this picture and the rest of the group just went around all in each room and just looked and looked and looked and looked and looked around it took them almost two hours almost two hours to get around and they came back and they were exiting the very same way that they came in and there lo and behold the same man is standing at this picture and when the guide comes back, he says, have you been here this whole time? He said, oh, yes, sir. He said, listen, you need to know something about me. He said, I see a problem with your picture. He said, what's the problem? He said, well, the picture here, it says checkmate. So you're either going to have to pay, change the name of your picture or you're going to have to ch- change the picture. He says, why is that? He says, well, I am a world champion chess player. And I've been standing here for the last couple hours looking at this chess board. And he said, 
I told you that I was a world champion chess player, right? Not everybody sees what a world champion sees all the time. And I've been studying this chessboard for a couple hours. And I realize that the king, he has one more move. <laughs> he has one more move. And you're going to have to name this something different because it's not checkmate. And I believe that God is wanting to tell all of us the king has another move. Many of us say, well, I know I, I gave my life to Jesus 15 years ago. Well, I was baptized, you know, 13 years ago. Well, I'm great. But the king has another move. And if you're still just muddling along and Satan may have you checkmated, God has another move that he wants to do for each one of us. And that is that he wants us to be submersed into the Holy Spirit and fire according to God. That's what he wants. So, I know this. Is that this morning I woke up and I shared with the prayer group this morning. He said, consecrate. This is Joshua. He said to the people of Israel, God already made him a promise 500 years nearly ago. I'm going to take you into that promised land. I'm going to take you into the promised land. And it was time. You know what it says? It says the men were prostituting themselves with Moabite women. They were in a place called Shittim. Is right next to the Jordan River. They were so close. If they tripped, they fell into nearly the land that God had promised them. That's how close they were, but they couldn't have been much further out of the will of God. So close, but not where they were supposed to be. And here's what Joshua told the people. He said, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. God is going to do mighty things among you. Consecrate yourself. You know what I would say to all of us? My friend puts it like this. He says, if you think the world was tough in 2020, this is T-ball. There's getting ready to be a 100 mile an hour fastball thrown at us. And what's going to separate the boys from the men is those brides who have not just the word, not just a lamp, but have oil in their lamp. You're the lamp. You're the vessel for the Holy Spirit. And what is God wanting? He's wanting his vessel to be filled with oil. So you can be burning bright, right? But you know what happens many times? Two words that God gave me this morning when I just woke up. Consecration and devotion. Remember, they consecrated themselves. They stepped out in faith and God parted the Jordan River. They went into the promised land and God says, listen, I want you to walk around Jericho. They walked around Jericho and you know what happened? The walls came tumbling down. But then one man named Achan went in. He had devoted, he said, listen, everything that we gather from Jericho is devoted unto the Lord. You may have devoted some things to the Lord. You may have said, God, my time is yours, my energy is yours, whatever is yours. And you may have done what Achan did. You know what Achan did? some of the devoted things it says and he hid them in his tent you know what he was called the troubler of israel because one man in covenant relationship had taken of the devoted things god wanted to bless them give them houses they didn't uh, build vineyards they didn't plant and wells they didn't dig but he said the first one out of the blocks you got to trust me you got to devote these things to me and don't you touch them. You walk in faith and you're going to watch me go deliver every single one of these enemies into your hands. But you know what? They went to AI, this little teeny tiny upstart of a little town, and 36 of their men died. And Joshua ended up on the ground. And God says, you have devoted things among you and you cannot be victorious until those things that have been devoted to me have been given back to me. You know what happened is a terrible, terrible story, tragic story of how ultimately not only Achan, but his entire family and everything was, they were stoned and they were burnt. And it was just, it was literally the, the Valley of Achor, which means trouble. But you know what? Later you see God prophesying through a prophet that he says the Valley of Achor is going to be a doorway of hope, that there is grace and mercy it's so incredibly beautiful. Will you bow your head with me for a moment? 
I want you to ask God, God, am I knocking right now? Am I asking? Am I seeking? How do you want me to consecrate myself? They had seen so many miraculous things. They had seen the Red Sea part. They had seen all the plagues come and squash every Egyptian god. But Joshua was getting ready to see the sun stand still. He was getting ready to see the walls of Jericho fall. And I believe that God has miracles in our future, that God is wanting to do great and mighty things, and that Pentecost was just the beginning. And this day is just a beginning step for us in our life. If we will consecrate ourselves and anything that we to give to him that he says, I want this. Will you consecrate this area of your life to me? And we do it. And we don't take back those devoted things that we can walk with new power and authority. So God, I'm asking for a holy hunger. I'm asking as one man came to desire you so powerfully that he said, Lord, either fill me or kill me. When he got to that point, that he wanted you more than life itself, you filled him and you won over a million people through him. And Lord, I'm asking you that you would give us a holy desire to be used by you in the most incredible ways. Lord, that you could bear much fruit through our life, that every demon of hell would know us by name because we have been sealed and we have been filled and we have been empowered by your Holy Spirit, and we have been purified by the work of your Father. So God, I ask that you would baptize us into the Holy Spirit and with this purifying fire that you promise that Jesus is not going to be just our sacrifice, not just our Savior, but our baptizer, the one who will baptize us in the third person of the Trinity and rescue us from the power of sin in our lives and give us authority to walk in newness of life. So God, I ask that it would be a reality, Father, for any of us here tonight that do not know what I'm talking about experientially. God, I ask that you would help us to ask, to seek, and to knock and not stop just like Jacob, I will not let you go until you bless me. Lord, give us that until in our hearts that we will not stop knocking and seeking and asking until you do in us what you so long to do in us. So Lord, I believe with all my heart when you tell us to wait, it's not because we have to wait on you. It's because you're waiting on us to come to the end of ourselves so, Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would help Steve Morris to come to the end of himself and would be no longer he who lives, but Christ who lives in him. And God, I pray that for each one of us, that you would have all of us and that you would get much glory from the fruit you bear in our lives. In Jesus' mighty, glorious name I pray. Amen.